Good morning, church. Stand up. Let's worship together. morning church welcome on this kind of dreary gloomy Sunday you could be anywhere but you chose to be here we know that you are all here for a reason today um, this morning I just wanted to read to you from um, Deuteronomy 322 you shall not fear them for it is the Lord your God who fights for you this next song is called surrounded this is how I fight my battles and it's just a reminder that Jesus came to earth to be by our side and to surround us and he is with us and we need to turn to him whatever the battle is that we're facing this is how we fight our battles with this being surrounded by him so let's just declare that this morning as we sing the song There's a table that you prepare for me in the presence of my enemy. It's your body. 
body the word you shed for me and this is how i fight my battle sing it again there's a table that you prepared for me in the prayer your body, your blood you shed for me, and this is how I fight my battle. And I believe you've overcome, and I will lift my song of praise for all you've done. And this is how I fight my
Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for this opportunity to, to sing that song and to just declare that today of, over this whole place, God, that we are surrounded by you and that you fight our battles and that you are there for us, God. I think sometimes we get so caught up in, in all of the, the pain and issues and problems that we're going through in our lives that we forget that you're there and that you love us and that you're fighting our battle for us, Father. I just thank you so much for who you are, for your name, and your name that is above all names, Father, that we get to sing your name, we get to praise your name in such a mighty and powerful name, Father. I pray that you just help us to remember that as we're singing to you, that this is not something to take light, God. This is this is amazing that we can do this for you and sing to you, Father. Just thank you so much. you 
Jesus, that we can just sing and praise you. Amen. Y'all don't need to hear from me. We just had church. Y'all go home. Well, hey, my name is Bobby. You can have a seat. Um, I'm one of the pastors here at, at the Ridge. We're so glad that you're uh, with us here this morning, whether you're uh, together with us here in this room or you're watching online on Facebook. We're glad that you've uh, gathered together with us for the, the gathering uh, of Ridge Church here uh, together. Uh, we're going to uh, give together here in just a moment, but before we do that, uh, two things just want to let you know about. If you are new here today, today's your first day uh, here with us or new for the first time online, uh, we'd love to connect with you. And so there's two ways that you can do that. Uh, if you're here in the room, you can grab the card in your seat there and you can fill that out and drop it off on the table outside these doors uh, when you walk out. Uh, or you can use our text number and just send the word hello uh, to 276-8107. Uh, and if you're watching online, you can use that text number or uh, go online to ridgechurch.info and fill out our connect card there. But however uh, you're connecting with us, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to say hello. We'd love to answer your questions. Uh, let us know how we can be praying with with you and praying for you or how to help you take that next step, whatever that next step is, whether it's getting into a community group or beginning to serve, however uh, God leads you today, we would love to help you do that. So we're going to give together in just a moment. There'll be some baskets come by your rows. You can give that way or you can go online to ridgegive.com and you can give online there. Uh, if you're new with us, we don't want you to feel obligated at all to give. We're just glad that you're here with us this morning. So as we prepare and get ready to give, I just want to remind you that when we give, we are reflecting the generosity of God to us and for us. Uh, we always take that verse, John 3.16, and we think about it in terms of our salvation, and, and there is truth to that. It is that, but it's so much more than that because we forget the part where it says that God so loved the world that he what? That he gave. That's right, that he was generous to us and for us by the giving of his son, Jesus. And so that empowers our generosity, not only here as we gather together, but our generosity to help us live generously as we do as one of our core values here at Rich Church. So with that in mind, let's pray. Let's give together whether you give in person or online. Father, we thank you so much for your generosity to us and for us. Father, we are uh, so thankful, so grateful, God, that, that we get an opportunity to give. And so, Father, we pray that as we do so, uh, we do it generously, we do it sacrificially, and we do it with glad and joyous hearts. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, well, if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and open that up to uh, 1 Samuel chapter, uh, we're going to start in chapter 9, but we're going to uh, spend a little bit of time in 15 uh, and 23. So uh, if you want to follow along uh, in your uh, paper Bible, you can do that, or it'll be on the screen back here behind me. Uh, if you have the YouVersion Bible app, uh, grab that and open it up, click on more, and then events, and you can actually get all of today's notes uh, right there for you that you can follow along with. Uh, as a young kid, I, uh, growing up, uh, I, uh, I've told this story uh, or uh, parts of this story uh, at different times, but you know, I, I grew up in a uh, small, uh, small country church uh, in the Clinton area, and uh, about 13 years old is when I began to, to really follow Jesus, uh, gave my life to Christ, was baptized, and then uh, not long after that, I really just began to, uh, to just do what I thought was the right next thing, and sometimes the right next thing was to, to begin to lead in ways that I never really saw my myself doing. I never expected myself to do. And honestly, as a young kid, I never really saw myself as a leader. But I was always that kid that like got my friends together. I was always that kid that sort of organized thing. I was always that kid when there was a, a vacuum a, a, or absence of leadership that I always would put myself up front and say, okay, let's, let's do this. I'll, I'll take care of this. I'll do this. We'll get this done. That, that kind of thing. And so as, you know, a 14, 15 year old teenager, uh, I, was, I was leading some Bible studies uh, in our church for our uh, 
youth group. I was uh, even eventually led vacation Bible school at like 16, 17 years old. Had no idea what I was doing, uh, but we had a lot of sugar cookies and Kool-Aid. It was awesome. And so we, uh, we did that and we did other things. And then eventually I got to the point to where I, I, I just started, I stepped into the role as, as a student pastor because I really felt like that that is where God was, was leading and calling me and then, you know, translate to, to get to, to here now. But I, I, I'll never forget this uh, because I never really saw myself as a leader. Uh, I'll never forget one of my mentors and pastor, uh, pastors. He, he told me one day, he said, he said, Bobby, I want you to hear me when I say this. I want you to know this, but you, you are a leader. And had he had never told me that, I don't know that I ever actually would have seen myself as a leader. But he followed it up with this. He didn't stop there. He didn't just say, you're a leader, now go lead. He said, you're a leader, but you need to understand this. You need to ask yourself this question. Where are you leading others? Where are you leading others? And then he told me this quote from John Maxwell. He said, he said everyone is leading somebody somewhere, but if you turn around and look and nobody's following, all you're actually doing is taking a walk. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. But I want to say the same thing to you that was said to me when I was 14, 15 years old, is that you, you are a leader. Every single one of you in this room, you are a leader in some form or context. Now, you might think to yourself, well, the only p- people that I'm actually leading is myself. Well, then that makes you a leader. You're leading yourself. Every one of us, in some way, is leading ourselves. But others of you, you're a parent. You're leading in your home, or you're a, a mom or a dad, and so you're, you're leading in some context there. Others of you, you're leading in the business world. You're leading others. You have a team of people that listen to you, that do do what you say, that take directives from you. Others of you, you're, you're leading in this church. Every single one of you in some form or context are a leader. Now, all of us, when we think about leadership, we think uh, of leadership sometimes. We, we have these pillars of leadership, uh, leadership in our lives, maybe. People that we've always learned from or we've taken quotes from, right? They're great historical leaders that we could all look to, you know, leaders of, of countries, you know, leaders uh, in the business world or marketplace, leaders uh, that are community activists, you know, leaders, leaders all around us, church leaders. I mean, leaders that we can learn a lot of things from. There are great leaders that we can learn from in the Bible, right? There's people like David and the prophet Elijah or Moses, you know, uh, Jesus, of course. That's a good one for us to, to look at, right? Uh, there are great leaders in Scripture. And a lot of times when we think about leadership, we always take leadership and we say, you know what? I am want to learn from people who, that are doing it right, who are doing it great, and I want to take from these things, and I want to learn from these things. Well, in today's passage of Scripture in 1 Samuel chapter 9, we're going to be introduced to a leader. But what we're actually going to learn from this leader is what actually not to do (laughs) as a leader. We're going to be introduced this morning to King Saul. Now, let me give you a little context uh, of Saul. King Saul is the first king of Israel, or will be the first king of Israel here as we're introduced to him in in chapter 9. And so this has been leading up to this point. As we've been walking through First uh, Samuel, the book of First Samuel, we, we learned about Samuel, who is the prophet and priest and sort of the de facto leader of Israel, the spiritual leader of Israel. But Samuel gets word from the Lord that the people of Israel, they don't, they don't want God as their king anymore. And we talked about that last week, about how the king that we follow will either take life from our soul will bring life to our soul. And so we talked about how, how the king that we choose, that, that God wants to be our true king. God wanted Israel to look at him as their true king. But the people of Israel said, no, 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 we, we want God, but not, we, we don't want God to be our only king. Like, we want another king. We want a king that will serve us. We want a king that will do for us. We want a king that we can tell what to do and he'll do it. And so Samuel, as the prophet, you know, his job is to listen to God and then relay those words to the people. So Samuel does what we should all do, right? In chapter 8, it says that he goes and he prays to God. And he's like, God, I don't know. I feel like there's something wrong with this. Like there's, this isn't exactly right. And God tells Samuel, you're right. I'm to be their true king. 
but they want an earthly king. And so God tells Samuel, give them what they ask for. Because what they will ask for and what they will learn and what they will see is they're asking for someone that they think will serve them. But what will really happen is they will serve this king. And so what we looked at last week is we said the king that we choose to follow is the king that we will serve one way or the other. And sometimes our king is disguised in the form of these sort of core idols that we've talked about throughout the, the book of First Samuel. The idol of control, the idol of power, the idol of approval, or the idol of comfort. And so the king that we give our heart to is the one that we tend to follow. And so God, though, in his, really in his mercy, because he wants the people of Israel to to understand and to know that he is to be their true king and that he can only do for them what the God of all power in the universe can do. God tells Samuel, at the end of 1 Samuel chapter 8, tells them, give them what they ask for. Give them a king. And so what we're looking at here this morning as we are introduced to this king, King Saul, is we're going to see that uh, if we want to, as as leaders, and again, no matter what context you're in, we are all leaders, but what we're actually going to learn from Saul this morning is how not to lead. In fact, we're going to look at three ways to actually fail at leadership. Uh, three ways to, to fail at leadership. So Saul, here is Saul in, in chapter 9. When we get to chapter 9, it's really kind of funny. There's some, some things that are happening here that, uh, just to get, frame this up and give you a little context, uh, Samuel, the, the prophet, is just kind of out doing his thing. He's on his circuit, you know, doing the, the judge thing is what it says that he's, he's out doing. But then over here is Saul. Now Saul has no idea that God has chosen him and will be appointed him as king. He has no clue about this. In fact, the way that we're introduced to Saul in the beginning is we're not going to read all of chapter 9. It would just take too long, but let me uh, summarize it for you. It says that Saul and his assistant, they're out sort of tending to his father's animals, and one of the donkeys gets lost, runs off, right? And so Saul and his servant, it says that they began to search for, for this donkey. And they're, like, Saul is really upset about this. Like, he's really kind of scared because he's afraid of what his dad's going to do if they don't find this donkey. So they're looking all over the place for this donkey, and they can't find it. And so his assistant has a great idea. He says, hey, there's a prophet down in town. Let's take him an offering, and we'll ask him. I mean, he's a prophet. He knows everything, right? He'll just ask God, and God will tell us where the donkey is. Great idea, right? So Saul and his assistant, they go down into the town. They go to Samuel. Now Samuel is waiting for Saul because he gets word from God. He says that the one who comes looking for this donkey is going to be king. And so here rolls in Saul, right? And Samuel's just like, this guy? (laughs) This is the one you picked? And so he comes in and Samuel gives the word to Saul and says, Saul, and again, I'm just summarizing here, but he said, you just read it for yourself. But he says, Saul, God has chosen you and has appointed you king over all of Israel. Now, I don't know about you, like if you got word like that from someone or just a calling, a very specific calling in general that came from God, I don't know how you would respond to that. I would hope that my response would be maybe elation. You know, it would start that way, then maybe I'd be scared or like, like there would be something that happens there. Saul's response is kind of funny because Saul's response is just kind of like, oh, cool, cool. But what about that donkey? We need to find that thing, right? Like, my dad is going to kill me if we don't find this donkey, right? And so uh, Samuel's just like, don't worry about the donkey. The donkey will take care of itself. God's got all of that. Like, you need to come with us. And so chapter 9 of 1 Samuel sort of ends with this banquet where they've got Saul there, you know, other elders of Israel, and Samuel is there, and there's just, you know, Samuel is giving Saul the instructions. And then chapter 10, chapter 10 is pretty funny too, because in chapter 10, what happens next is Saul is actually introduced to the nation of Israel as king. 
And so in this moment, here's Saul who has been appointed as king over all of Israel. This is the guy that the entire nation has been wanting. Remember chapter 8, they were like, we want a king. And God's like, give him a king. And this is going to be the guy that's going to be the king. And so he, uh, Samuel calls in the whole nation of Israel. All of the tribes are represented. They're all gathered together. There's these thousands of people. You know, there's like this big celebration. They're, they've got this stage set up. Samuel walks walks out and he announces Saul as king and he says you know something to the effect of I want to introduce to you your king King Saul right dun 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 hey right you know the whole thing right like everybody's like going nuts and so here they're saying King Saul Psst, somebody go find Saul King Saul right he doesn't come out now he's nowhere to be found like, where is this guy? Well, actually, what's happening is, is Saul is backstage hiding underneath some burlap sacks and carpet. <laughs> and then finally, they, they get him out, and they, they trot him out there, and Samuel says, here's the guy you wanted. Congratulations, right? He's like, this is who God has picked for you. You wanted him, your boy, Saul, right? And here is Saul, and it sort of kicks off his kingship. It's not going so well already, right? In fact, Saul is probably like, hey, uh, by the way, again, what happened to that donkey? Are we still? Okay, good. But here he starts, right? He's not really starting out on a great foot. You see, Saul, Saul never really found himself and never really saw himself as a leader, especially there in the beginning, until he did. And then he really begins to take advantage of it. But what I want to show you here briefly is I just want to show you three lessons that we can learn on how from Saul, from his kingship through uh, several chapters here and that we will breeze through really quickly, three lessons that we can learn on how we can fail at leadership. And so essentially what we're going to learn is to do not what Saul did, right? And how we can learn this. So... Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, if you want to fail as a leader, and again, it doesn't matter what context you're in. It doesn't matter if you're leading one or you're leading hundreds. If you want to fail at leadership, pick and choose which of God's commands to follow. Just pick and choose the ones that you like. Pick and choose the ones that make you feel comfortable. Disregard the ones that make you feel uncomfortable. Just pick and choose the ones that you actually like. You see, the prophet Samuel, he, he gives Saul, when we get to chapter 15, he gives Saul some specific instructions that he gets from God to destroy this nation that has come against them, the Amalekites. And, and when he gets these instructions, the specific instructions are, are this, destroy everything. Destroy, like take nothing for yourself, even the king himself, everything. In fact, this is what it says, 1 Samuel 15, verse 9, it says this, it says, Saul, this is what happens, it says, Saul and the troops, he's got these specific instructions from God, it says, Saul and the troops spared Agog, that's the king, and the best of the sheep, goats, cattle, and choice animals, as well as the young rams, and the best of everything else. They were not willing to destroy them but they did destroy all of the worthless and unwanted things. And so here's what Saul did. Saul had a specific command and instruction from God and said, Nah, I don't really want to go all the way with you, God. I just want to go part of the way. So he kept, they kept the good things. And they did not kill the king. And then they just destroyed the things that were worthless. I want you to understand, church, and, and I am as guilty of this as anybody, if not more than anybody, but half obedience is disobedience. Saul had a specific command and call from God and was disobedient to that command. He disobeyed the part that he didn't like. You see, when God's commands seem to be uncomfortable or inconvenient for us, we're tempted to choose which of these commands that we want to follow, don't we? Again, I, I can actually be really good at this. It's the idol of comfort that creeps back up inside of me. It's that when I get a command or when I hear from the Lord and I go, yeah, but I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't really like that. Can I just do like this instead of this? 
right? Uh, back in uh, December, I, I think I may have told you guys this uh, back in January, but we've had a pandemic since then, so you probably forgot. Um, but I, uh, I was in Kroger shopping, and it, by the way, it's Kroger, not the Kroger's, okay? Uh, so I was in Kroger, <laughs> I was just pet peeve, sorry. I was in Kroger shopping, and I had gathered, you know, the things that I needed, and I was going through the checkout line, and there was a, a, a younger guy there, a, ca- a cashier, and I, I was doing what most of us do when we go through the checkout line, right? I just asked, hey, how's it going, man? Like, you know. And w- most of the time, people respond with, oh, you know, living the dream. You know, things are good. Things are well, whatever, right? Like, that's kind of what we expect to hear nine out of ten times. Well, this guy did not respond that way. He actually, he actually, I think, was just being honest. And he said, man, not too good. And, he start, and I was like, oh, really? Well, you know tell me about that. So he starts telling me about it, and he's had like all of these things that were happening at this time, and it was just, I mean, just some tragic things that were going on in his life, some loss and and different things like that, and I I could feel in my spirit, I could feel just, you know, and you, maybe you've been there before, but just in my spirit and in my bones where God was just telling me, you need to pray for this guy, but not just like pray for him, like, hey man, I'll pray for you, you know, everything's going to be cool, I'll pray for you, and like walk out and then forget because you get in the car and like, you know, life happens, and then like three days later, you're like, oh, I forgot to pray for that guy. Not like that, but I felt God saying, you need to pray for this guy right here, right now, tick everybody off that's in the line behind you because you're holding up the line, and like look weird and do all those things, and you know what I did? I walked out. I just walked out. Because in my mind, I was going, I'll I'll pray for him, but God, I mean, like, really? Like, right here? Like, that, I mean, come on, you know? I mean, you're going to, like, everybody's going to be mad at me, you know, I'm going to look weird, it's going to sound weird, like, he's going to think I'm weird. So I walked out. And the whole way that I'm walking through the parking lot, walking to my truck, you know, pushing this cart full of groceries, I could just feel God going, great job, pastor way to go, you know, like I just, I feel God, it, like I feel that it, like conviction over me, and I could just, and, and I, I, I knew, I knew what I had to do, so I put my groceries back in the truck, I turned around, I walked back in, I was like, I'm gonna find this guy, and I'm gonna make it weird, and we're just gonna pray, because I ain't going out like that, I walked back in, walked back to the line that I, that I had checked out through, and he was gone, nowhere to be found, I walked around the store trying to find this guy, you know, and he had like a faux hawk, you know, haircut, and I'm walking around like going, guy with the faux hawk, you know, I wasn't really, but, but I felt like that, right, like I'm just walking around the store trying to find this, could not find him anywhere, and so I told myself, I was like, well, I'm in here a lot, I'll be in here probably tomorrow, and, you know, like, I'll find him, I'll pray for him then, never seen him again, never, ever seen him again, but it doesn't matter. Like, the thing that I did was no different than the thing that Saul did. Right? I, I failed. I failed it at leadership in that moment. I, w- I was disobedient to the Lord. God gave me a specific command. God gave me a specific thing to do. And I tried to circumvent that by just saying, you know what? I'll do it the way that makes me feel okay and comfortable instead of the way that God is actually calling me to do it. This is exactly what Saul did. You see, often we can ignore his commands and compromise his standards even as we try to serve him. You see, Saul was, he was like half in, right? He was like, you know, God, I, I mean, I did most of what you asked. I just didn't do everything that you asked. I mean, that's got to be good enough, right? I mean, 70 percent's better than zero. Am I right, God? Come on. But are we willing to be led by God's voice and commands even even when it's uncomfortable or when it does not benefit us at all. Listen to the way that Samuel responds to Saul in verse 22 of 15. He says this. He says, Then Samuel said to Saul, Does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? He asks a question. And he says, look, to obey is better than sacrifice. To pay attention is better than the fat of rams. Samuel says to Saul, he says, it's better to be obedient 
than to give a half sacrifice. So that's number one. If we want to fail as a leader, again, whether we're leading one, our family, or hundreds, just pick and choose which of God's commands to follow, the ones that make us feel comfortable. The second way to fail, we're going to stick with this same story from 15. The second way is to just blame shift. Shift the blame to somebody else. Don't take ownership. After Saul was confronted by Samuel on, on not doing what God instructed, he, he shifts the blame and he, and he doesn't take ownership of what has happened. Look at verse 19 again here in 15. So we're skipping around here. It says this, it says, Samuel asked Saul, he says, So why didn't you obey the Lord? Why did you rush on the plunder and do what was evil in the, in the Lord's sight? Listen to the way that, that Saul responds. He says, But I did obey the Lord. Uh, is, am I the only one who hears my kid's voice like in that when it says, But I did do it, right? It's like, But this is what I told you to do, but I did do it. It's like, No, you only half did it, all right? Saul says, he says, but I did obey the Lord. He says, Saul answers, he said, I went on the mission that the Lord gave me. I brought back King Agog of the uh, Amalek, and I completely destroyed them. The troops took sheep, goats, and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was set apart for destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. So what Saul did was he just shifted the blame to his soldiers. He said, I did what God said to do. It's their fault. They're the ones that took all the good things. I destroyed the things that I was supposed to destroy, except he didn't, right? He was the leader. He was the one that had to take ownership of what happened or didn't happen. And so what he did and said was he just shifted the blame. And you see, this, this blame shifting is something that's been happening since the beginning of time for us. This is something that, that we've inherited from our spiritual mothers and fathers. Adam and Eve, right? If you go back to Genesis 3, you don't have to turn there, but just, you know, in Genesis 3, we see this exact thing happen in the fall when sin is introduced to the world to us through Adam and Eve's disobedience. It is blame shifting that takes place. There's Eve who is deceived by Satan to eat of the, the tree of good and evil, And then when she gives it to Adam and Adam eats, Adam, when he is confronted by God and says, who told you to eat the fruit? And what does Adam say? <laughs> that woman, she's the one, you know, she's the one. You hadn't given me this woman, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have messed up like that, right? We've been doing that ever since, right? Husband's like, it's, just, you know, it's not my fault. I didn't do it. It's her fault. She's the one. And so we, it's, it's this blame shifting. It's not taking ownership of the situation it reminds me of when when I was probably I guess I was like eight or nine years old and I um I hit my brother I smacked him, I smacked him in the face I don't remember why he must have deserved it um but I, <laughs> I smacked him in the face and then of course when I got in trouble for it right my parents came to me and and did what the parents do and what we do as parents is they came to me and said why did you hit your brother and my, I'll never forget my response. I said, I didn't hit him. It was my hand. It just, you know, like I couldn't stop it. You know, like I, like I acted it out and everything. It was like I couldn't stop it. It just, it just did it, you know. Of course, my mom was like, your hand did that all on its own. Yeah, I just, you know, I was just blame, I was just blame shifting. You see, and blame shifting, here's where blame shifting has its root. It has its root in the idol of controls because we don't want to be out of control. We don't want to look like we messed up. We don't want to look like we made a mistake. So we find a way to shift the blame from ourselves and not take ownership for ourselves and shift it to someone else or to something else. See, sometimes the hardest thing to do is to take ownership of our mistakes, own them, and repent. See, leaders who fail never take ownership of their mistakes. Leaders who fail never say, you know what, it was my fault. Even if it wasn't their fault. If it was the team's fault. If it was somebody, like, in a way to just be able to say, you know what, this is on me. Parents, this is one of the hardest things to do with our kids, isn't it? 
to own up and to ask for forgiveness and to repent before our children when we've made a mistake or when we have done something that causes the need for forgiveness is to stand in front of our own children and say, you know what, that's my fault. I'm sorry. Forgive me. It's hard to do that with our spouses. It's hard to do that in the office. It's hard to do that wherever we're leading. But we have to acknowledge the truth of others' reproof in our lives. Samuel came to Saul and said, Saul, this is on you. And Saul said, "Uh uh-uh, ain't on me. It's their fault. Number three, last one. If you want to fail at leadership, just resent those who disagree with you. Look at everyone who disagrees with you and look at them as your enemy. I think one of the most dangerous things I see in leaders and Christ followers of all types is when they are given sound, godly advice, and because it disagrees with them, they ignore it and they do their own thing. I I have... A, an, an amazing opportunity and honor to get to coach pastors from all over the world and I was coaching a pastor last year one that I'd become fairly close to and uh, was coaching him and as we were talking through some things he told me uh, one day he said hey I need to I need you to let, let you know about some things because uh, I just wanted you to to be in support of me here because I know there's going to be a lot of people against me he said but I really I've prayed about this and I know that this is the right thing to do. I know that this is right. I feel, I feel like this is what God is calling me to do. You know, so I'm prepared and I'm ready. I'm like, oh, okay. You know, what's this, what's this thing? And he says, well, and he says, I want you to know that I've decided to, I'm, gonna, I'm leaving my family uh, because I've fallen in love with this other woman. But I know that like, this is what God wants for us. This is, this is what God is, I feel like this is what God is confirming in my soul. And I was like, bro, God ain't confirming that in your soul. <laughs> I said, that's wrong. And he said, no, 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 you don't understand. Like, I've prayed about this. I said, yeah, to the wrong God. And so I was, I was very adamantly against what he was saying. But he, he went a step further and he, and he told me, he said, no, 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 you don't understand. I need you to be on my side about this because I'm not leaving. Like, I'm, I, I know that I have to leave my family. I was like, I, I get that. But I want you to understand, like, I'm not leaving the ministry. I'm, I'm going to leave my church, but I'm going to go start a new church. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you just made it all better. No, you didn't. And so we went through for weeks all of the reasons why, bro, you're, this is wrong. And uh, ultimately it got to the point to where he just decided, you know what, if you're not going to agree with me, you're not going to support me, you're not going to get behind me on this, I don't need you. And so he went and found people that would. You see, as leaders, and especially as Christ followers, like we need to be around people who can give us sound, godly advice. And when that comes to us and we disagree with it, we need to understand and we need to know most of the time, I'm not going to say 100% of the time, but most of the time, if they are Christ followers and they love Jesus and they love you, what they are actually telling you, even if it is in opposition of what you feel like you want or what you need, Instead of resenting them and pushing them away, we should receive it as much as it may hurt. We need to understand that there are times when people, it seems like people are in opposition of us, they're actually being for us. There are times as uh, here in our church where we are, we are in a, a plurality of elders, meaning that I'm not pastor CEO. I am one of five elders, and we have an elder team that will tell me no sometimes. Wes, am I right about that? No, it's mostly Wesley. Uh, he just, he's a, hater. he's a hater. He says no to everything. Yeah, he is. He's ginger. <coughs> But they will tell me no sometimes, and, and I, don't, I, I never take that as, well, they just don't like me. They just don't love me. They just, in fact, here's what I know. This is why these people are in the room is because they love Jesus and they love the church and they love me and it's in that order. 
And so I know that because they love Jesus and because they love the church and because they love me, that when I feel like there is opposition in the room, it's because they are actually for Jesus and they are for the church and they are for me. I just might be wrong. And so if we want to fail in our own leadership, just surround yourself with people that always say yes to you. Just surround yourself with people that will always agree with you. Just say, just surround yourself with people that never push back against you. It will ultimately lead to a place of destruction. Oftentimes, the disagreement in godly counsel can just reveal our blind spots and show us areas in our own lives that that need more attention. My wife is really good at this. And I don't mean that like in a mean way. I mean it in in a great way because I know that she loves me and that she is for me even when I don't like the counsel that she offers. And that happens. We were having a discussion the other night, and I was like way over here on this issue, and she was like way over here on this issue. And she just looked at me, and she said, you need to know that I'm right. And I said, okay, you're right. (laughs) You know, it's just like, hey, listen, you can either be married or you can be right. You can't be both. So, right, like you just, sometimes you just have to say. But it was really kind of a funny moment. And I, and I, and I, I took that, and and. That there are times that that happens. Like sometimes there just needs, you, 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 you can't resent people who disagree with you. But Saul, Saul was doing this. In fact, it says here at the end of 15, and we'll kind of see how this wraps up here, but it said, uh, it, it goes on to say that, that uh, Samuel would have very little interaction with Saul after this. So these, these three things aren't just, you know, good leadership principles. They are good ways of life for every Christ follower, or really, honestly, any person in general. But Saul's kingship gives us a clear example of a person who exhibited all these core idols, these four core idols that we've been talking about throughout this whole book, the idol of power and comfort and control and approval. But not only do we get a clear example of these, we get a clear warning from God on the consequences of pursuing and living through these idols. So I want to show you something here as we close. I want to show you something that literally made me sick to my stomach when I came across this this week. It was, it was honestly just unnerving to me, and, I, and I, I found it to be one of the most sad things I had ever read, but at the same time, so convicting to me. But back in 1 Samuel 15, when Saul disobeyed God and he shifted the blame to his soldiers and really fell victim to his idols, I read something that just got me. Uh, Samuel, he, he he learns the truth that Saul did not destroy all the things that God had called him to destroy, right? He he only did half of what God was actually telling him to do. And he spared the king, even though he was told to kill the king. And he kept all of the good spoils for himself. Samuel confronts Saul. Look at this in verse 32 of 1 Samuel 15. It says this, it says, Samuel said, bring me King Agog of Amalek. And Agog came to him trembling, for he thought, certainly the bitterness of death has come. Now, there's a translation that actually says this. There's a translation that actually says that he came in cheerfully. And so there's some discussion on, did he come in trembling or did he come in cheerfully? I can see both ways playing out, right? The king, knowing that he should have been put to death, can come in cheerfully. Like walking into the room like hey, I got out of this one like I'm good, right? Just this, yeah, just this past week, uh, Friday, Wesley Hicks and I were uh, out. We got off site to go and and plan some some sermons coming up for next year, which we're super, super excited about. But we were out uh, in downtown Knoxville, right outside of the federal courthouse there and and Knox County Courthouse, and we're out there, you know, doing some sermon planning. And so there's all of these people like walking back in, walking out. Some of them are lawyers. Some of them are people that are going to court. Some of them are coming out of court. And we're sitting there, and there was this young man and young woman that, that come walking out. And as they come walking out of the courthouse, they walked past us. And this guy literally just Conor McGregored himself, like, through the hallway there. If you don't know what I'm talking about, like, he was high-stepping, like this. 
just giving it all he had, right? And he goes, woo, ain't going to prison today, you know? And he's just like walking, right? <laughs> and and I, we're dying. We're just like, that just happened. I cannot, that's amazing, like right there, right? And he's cheerfully walking out of a situation that could have went really badly for himself, right? And so in my mind, this is kind of how I pictured, you know, this scene going down. But this translation here says that he came in trembling also. So knowing that he should have been put to death, but he wasn't. Verse 33, it says, Samuel, the prophet, declared to the king, he says, As your sword has made women childless, so your mother will be childless among women. Listen to this. Then he hacked Agog to pieces before the Lord. Now, y'all think Game of Thrones is cool? This ain't got nothing on that. Y'all think the Old Testament is boring? It ain't boring. Homeboy Samuel chopped the dude up. But listen listen to what it says next. It says, Samuel went to Ramah and Saul the king went up to his home and even to the day of his death Samuel never saw Saul again Samuel was like I'm done with this guy but here's the part that got me it says Samuel mourned for Saul and the Lord regretted he had made Saul king over Israel that word regretted The translation of that is great sorrow and mourning. So it's not like, listen, I want you to understand this. It's like, are you saying that God made a mistake by choosing Saul as king? That's not what it's saying. It's not saying regret in the way that you and I may have regrets. It's like, oh man, I made a mistake there. That's not what this this word regret means. It means great sorrow and mourning. He was sad, and he was sad because of the man that he had chosen to put over his people whom he loved. The nation of Israel was going to be led so poorly by a man that was going to fail at his calling over and over and over again. And the only thing that I could think of this week was the moment that I would hope and pray never comes that God would ever look down at me and say, Bobby, I regret the day that I made you the father of those children. I regret the the day that I made you the husband of that wife. I regret the day that I made you the leader of those people or the pastor of that church. You see, Saul, Saul was a man who continually over and over again would resent those who disagreed with him, would blame shift, and would just pick and choose the commands of God to follow. So how do we not fall into this trap? How do we, how do we not get overtaken by our idols? Whether you're just... And I don't want to say just as in, oh, just, but because it's a high calling. But whether you're a mama leading at home, a father or a, a team in a job leading just one other person or leading multiples of people. It sounds too obvious, but we have to look to Jesus on the cross. Jesus is the true and better Saul. His kingdom is... His kingdom is upside down from ours. It's like the way that we see the world, the way that we see things playing out is not the way they play out in the kingdom of Jesus. You see, when it comes to the idol of control, when we look at Jesus on the cross, we see Jesus submitted himself to the Father, and where it seemed like things were out of control, God was accomplishing his purpose to defeat sin once and for all. When it came to the idol of power, Jesus gave up his power. And when he could have called down a million angels to destroy those crucifying him, he remained humble. And when it came to the idol of approval, Jesus, who was sought after by crowds and multitudes of people calling out to him, screaming how much they loved him and wanted him, those same crowds would be the ones that would want to trade him innocent and blameless for a murderer named Barabbas 
And when it came to the idol of comfort, Jesus on the cross was mocked, beaten, and crucified, and did so as an act of obedience to the Father. Listen to the, to the way that the Apostle Paul summarizes this for us in Philippians chapter 2, and I'll close with this. This is what Paul says. He says, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affliction and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Paul says this, he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. And he says, you want to be great in the eyes of, of, of the Lord? You want to be great in this world? He says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. He says this, he says, Who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, when we chase after the idols to become great, we chase after power. We chase after control. I chase after comfort. We chase after these idols of approval. When we chase after these things, we make these things our king, and they will lead us to failure after failure after failure after failure. And in the kingdom of Jesus, everything is opposite. Everything is upside down. Jesus says, you want to be great? Become the least. You want to be awesome? Make yourself humble. And so we have to look to Jesus. And so as we end our time here this morning, before we walk out of this room, we're going to sing a song together as we close. And as we do so, I just want you to, to take the time to, to pray to the Lord and ask yourself this question. Is there anything that stands between you and Him that you need to lay at His feet? Is it approval? Is it control? Is it comfort? Is it power? Is it any of these things that think that makes you this great leader, that none of these things make you a great leader? What actually makes you a great leader is that we set our eyes on Jesus, and moment by moment and day by day, we do the best of our flawed and broken ability to follow Him. And we're not always going to get it right, and it's not always going to be perfect. But that's why we, re that's why we have repentance to change direction, to turn away from and to turn to. And so that's what we want to do this morning. We're going to sing a song together, and I just want you to pray through these moments. And so will you pray with me now? Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for how it challenges our soul and our heart. God, I pray as, as we as we look at what it means to be leaders, whether we're leading just one, four, or tens, or hundreds, God, God, that you remind us that the way to be, the way to be the leader that you have called us to be, God, is to set our eyes on you, to humble ourselves before you, God, to serve those around us and not seek to be served, So, Father, help us. God, would you call to our attention, would you call to our hearts these places, God, that, that keep us from that and give us the courage to lay them at your feet. As you contemplate these things and, and continue to pray through these things, I just want to encourage you to, to take that next step, whatever that next step may be, whether you're watching online or you're here in the room together, that you can use our, our text number that 
that we'll have up on the screen to text in and say, here's my next step or here's how you can pray with me or pray for me or take a moment to, to fill out a Connect card before you leave today. Let us walk with you. Let us pray with you. Whatever that step is that God leads you to take, remember, half obedience is disobedience. So we want to be obedient before the Lord. Father, we love you. We thank you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Chosen me.